Thank you, Brother Whaley. Praise the Lord, everybody. I want to thank the Lord for the prayers of uh, the camp meeting and for the um, general focus on prayer. I've been on that list for a while, and um, we prayed the Lord would give us strength to be able to participate in this camp meeting. I wasn't able to make the Oklahoma camp meeting this year because they were knocking me out doing a procedure every week. I had what was called Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition. And um, I went the last time here two or three weeks ago, and everything is clear and looks good. And praise God. We praise God for that. Amen. Amen. But thank you for praying. God bless your heart. Amen. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. It's sublimest strains that reach to the majesty on high. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways, while all the angels in heaven rejoice and say, Behold, he prays. O thou by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself has trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. Thank God for our answered prayer. Yes. Amen. Have you ever had a prayer answered and you Hallelujah. know it was answered? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. And just uh, a lot of caring, a lot of uh, expressions from people, people all over the country who we knew were praying for us. And I feel like the Lord has had his way. And... Um, I determined I was going to do it anyway. Thank God. So there are several elements of faith that you have to consider. And one of them is, uh, as Jesus taught, like the unjust judge. I'm going to do it lest they worry me to death. Yeah. Persistence in prayer is, uh, is, is a key element as well. Amen? Amen. Thank God. Lord bless you. You may be seated. And we've enjoyed being with you in this camp meeting. I hope that you have received something from uh, perhaps something that was said. I enjoyed the service last night. Yeah. Amen. Great presence and power of God. Great ministry of Brother Cunningham. Appreciate our, our district board, Brother and Sister Tinney, all the efforts that are made here. And the great improvements that have been made here as well. May God bless them for those efforts. Thank God. The Word of God is important. Yes. Thank God. And uh, there is no way that we can exist nor live without the direction of the power of God Amen. and the Word of God. Amen. Thank God for His ministry. Everybody needs a preacher, their own, their own preacher. That's one thing you can't borrow when you need it the most is a preacher. You need your very own. Thank God. Now, I'm going to be teaching you today on uh, called Breaking the Code of Pilate. But I wanted to show you a, uh, this is the title... Uh, page here today, Breaking the Code of Pilate. I don't think my little machine is going to reach that far. But uh, I'm a, a member of the Institute of the Dead Sea Scrolls Society and Studies. I've been sent all of the unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, when what you're looking at is called the... Uh, smoking gun of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what was kept hidden for 40 years until uh, University of Berkeley, they began to bootleg into it. And the man, man over the antiquities department 
in Jerusalem was manic depressive and an alcoholic anyway finally when they were able to get them they began to send them out to as many people that could work with them as they could and uh, so whatever I find I cannot publish I have to send to them but the good thing whatever someone else finds I get it first so you're looking and it just looks like a lot of scrabble but you see a little smudge place up there it's not showing up real well that reads right there Mixat Mahas Hatorah and that means the important works of the law now why this was the smoking gun is the Jews dislike Paul one thing they said was Paul uh, fought a straw soldier that uh, the Jews did not say that the law saved you that you kept the law it saved you and Paul taught often it is not the works of the law that saves you but it's the grace of God well they said he, he was fighting a straw soldier and uh, there was no such teaching as being saved by the works of the law but you've got it in front of you today that Paul was not fighting a straw soldier these mixat makas haTorah these are these are 13 important works of the law they said if you keep them you are saved so he knew what he was talking about yeah. amen he wasn't fighting a straw soldier they wanted to keep this down because it names those 13 laws if you kept then you were saved so he was not fighting a straw soldier but uh, we believe it's the grace of God that saves us amen? amen we know that it is we're going to talk about breaking Pilate's code and uh, you have heard a lot a lot lately I'm sure about uh, the Bible code have you not a book published by a man by the name of Drosnin and uh, work done by uh, a man by the name of Rips uh, and uh, comment upon that by uh, Weitzman several different men who commented upon that but uh, this is the Jerusalem report who uh, did a uh, thing on on that Bible code the uh, there this is the front page of the Jerusalem report busting the Bible code breakers and the uh, the Bible code uh, is the mystics of Israel that date all the way back to Abraham and since the writings of Moses they believe that mysteriously and mystically hidden in the uh, Bible and the Torah were different words you remember Drosnin uh, predicted by the Bible code what is called equal distance lettering skip take every 39th letter and uh, it will spell the Torah in fact in the first words of Genesis Bereshith bara alehem so on uh, taking a certain uh, a number of words pick your number and you find the word uh, Yahweh which is the unpronounceable name of God in the Old Testament but they like to find different messages and as you see them here just skipping different letters and uh, they predicted three days before the death of Rabin that he was to die they predicted uh, the death of President Kennedy and they predicted many many world happenings by simply taking say like the seventh number seventh letter of the law it reads from the right to the left taking a certain number picking a certain number and uh, this will give a hidden and secret message in this Bible code and uh, it seemed quite powerful and made the news and uh, the world really looked at it, it became quite popular 
They made a challenge, and they said, uh, we challenge anybody to take the book Moby Dick and do the same thing with it. Well, there was a mathematician in the University of Australia by the name of Brandon McKay who took the book of Moby Dick and found where, uh, what was it, uh, 13 world leaders where their death had been predicted in the book of Mo, uh, Moby Dick. In the book of Moby Dick. Predicted 13 world leaders and their death. Proving, he said, that if the text is large enough, you can do anything. So that's what this is about. Busting the Bible code breakers. Showing you that there was nothing to it. But this science, they called it, by the Kabbalist, they are the mystics, was at its strongest point at the time that Jesus was on the earth. And he had to deal with it, and I'll show you how he dealt with it, and uh, it, is, uh, it is amazing. But uh, let me read the scripture to you first, if I may. We're going to talk about breaking the code of Pilate. Something very unusual that is said here. And we read from John 18 and 33 through 36. Therefore Pilate again entered into the Praetorian and called Jesus and said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, saying this from him, or say, are you saying this from yourself? Or have others told you about me? Pilate said, I am not a Jew, am I? Your nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What did you do? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was of this world, my attendants would have struggled that I should not be delivered by the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Uh, it is my own translation from the reading of the Greek. But looking at John uh, 19, if you will, and verse 19, we see uh, another writing. Translate it directly if I uh, may for you. And uh, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth. I would like to correct that. That's my own mistake. It is Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And this title then read many of the Jews for the place where they crucified him was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then the chief priest of the Jews, or they uh, said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And uh, I want you to notice his commitment. What I have written, I have written. Everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Pilate's personal conviction relative to Christ has always been an intrigue to me. I personally believe that he was convinced that Jesus at least was king of the Jews and that he was extraordinary. He asked Jesus three times, are you a king? And as you saw, Jesus said, now are you saying this from yourself? Or did others tell it to you? Pilate said, I'm not a Jew, am I? He expects a negative reply. The Greek tells you whether it expects a negative or a positive reply. He said, it is your own people that are accusing you. I am not a Jew. But um, he kept asking him three times, I told you. He says, "You are you a Jew? Once he, he said it this way. 
You are really not. The word is uk un. It is what you would call a positive negative. He actually expected Jesus to say, I am the king of the Jews by the way that it was written in the Greek. And uh, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, it was my attendants would have fought to prevent the Jews from taking me. And uh, then he told Pilate something very strange. He said, therefore, an inferential, those who delivered me to you have a greater guilt than you do. You must remember that Pilate's wife had told him previously, have nothing to do with this just man. For I have suffered many things uh, because of this man. Pilate brought him out to the Jews three times as well and said, I find no fault in this man. And uh, he, of course, they said, well, if you are not going to do what we say, you are not a friend of Pilate. At one time he brought him out and he said, look. This is your king. And I believe he really meant what he said. And the strangest thing, the Jews who would never claim any king, said, we have no king but Caesar. Uh At that moment, they were willing to accept Caesar over Jesus Christ. Uh And, uh, but he presented them to them. And, uh, but Pilate wrote a title. And uh, I was following the King James when I wrote that Jesus of Nazareth. But the article is there really. It says, the title says, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. And to make it where it would be understood, he wrote it in three languages. He wrote it in Hebrew and in Roman or Latin and in Greek. Nobody said anything. Greeks didn't say anything. Romans didn't say anything. The only ones that said anything were the high priest and the scribes who saw something in what he had written that they did not like. They said, don't write it that way. Change the wording some way and we will accept it. Because they had been told several times by Pilate, This is your king. But it was the way that Pilate wrote it and the way that you write it in Hebrew and then they being familiar with the Bible code found something in it that they did not like. And I'm going to show you what they were looking at when they looked at the words Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And you've got to remember that this reads from the right hand to the left hand. And uh, they were studying. I believe uh, that there was no problem uh, as far as just saying he was the king of the Jews. In fact, they said, uh, write it, I am the king of the Jews. Any way that you can do it to change the wording... Because the way that you have worded it does a very strange thing. At the top, you have the, the word uh, Yeshua, Hanazara, uh, Vumelech, uh, Ha Yehudim. Jesus, the Nazarene King of the Jews. But let's go back and to the first one. And take the first letter is a yod. Bring it down. Keep the same picture up there. Uh, bring it down. The first letter on the right is a yod. That's a comma. Just like a comma. You remember Jesus said, uh, not one yod or, or not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away. The word is not one yod. The smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. That's it right there. The first one. The tittle is a titlos. It is the little curlicue on the top of the letters. A little decoration. 
Jesus said, the yolk nor the tiniest de decoration will disappear on the writing of the law until it is fulfilled. But the first letter on the right is a yot, the next one is a hey, and the next one is a V or a B, depending on whether you ask an Ozzy or Sephardi, and the next one is a hey. That word spells, and that comes from the first, if you take the first of each one of these letters, it spells Yahweh. Change it any way you want to. But when you write it this way, you are calling him Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. And that's what they did not like. Amen. They said, do it anyway. Say, I am the king of the Jews. That'll change it. But when you put it this way, we don't want you to write it like that. That was hurting their feelings. Because that was the name of the God of the Old Testament. Amen. But Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. You have two perfect tense Gegagratha, and it is emphatic. He wrote it so it would be emphatic. I am not going to change it one bit because Pilate understood what they were reading. That he was saying, This is Yahweh. Right. Amen. And he says, What I have written, I have written. So we're going to talk about breaking Pilate's code today. Amen. I'm asking you, if you want to break the code of Pilate, or if you're willing to say what he said, what I have written, I have written. Thank God. How many believe that he is not only the king of the Jews, but he is Yahweh? of the Old Testament. Praise God. Just leave that up there. If you, j just leave it up there if you don't mind. I'll be referring to it uh, again in just a little bit. Amen. John the Baptist told them on the river. He said, uh, the, the prophets prophesied. He said, I am the messenger. I will send my messenger before your face. And he will prepare the way of Yahweh. The word Lord is Yahweh. Now the Jews say it is the unpronounceable name of God. As you can see, it is only four consonants. The vowels were not la added until the Masoretism, and that was years later. But they, um, uh, they took those four consonants, or those, those consonants, and they said, we don't know how to pronounce the name of God in the Old Testament. And uh, it is, they worship a God whose name we do not know. The unpronounceable name. The only reason that you have, and in the King James is Jehovah, really more correctly, Yahweh, is to take the vowels that belong under the word earthly Lord, Adonai, and put those same vowels under, uh, they're just little dots and dashes, and put those dots and dashes around this tetragrammaton. That that you see on the bottom is called the Tetragrammaton, or four letters, four writings. Put the vowels of Adonai, earthly Lord, underneath the Tetragrammaton, and you come out with Yahweh. I was attending a uh, Sephardi uh, Hebrew class. I had had Ashkenazi earlier in school. But in every class, the rabbi would say, we do not know how to pronounce the name of the God of the Old Testament. Uh, the only way we know how to pronounce it is to take uh, the vowels that belong under Adonai, put them under the Tetragrammaton, and you come out with Yahweh. 
And I would agree with him every time that uh, he taught. He couldn't stand it any longer. He come to me knowing uh, what I was and who I was. And he said, M.D., he said, I, I see that you agree with me on my assessment of the Tetragrammaton. I said, I agree with you. He said, how can you do that? I said, because I do not believe there are three persons in the Godhead. I believe there is only one God. Amen. He said, how is it that you believe it? I said, what is your abbreviation? They will not write out the full four or the tetragrammaton. They will not write it out. It is too holy. There are some words that are called sacra noma. That means they are too holy. And as I told you yesterday, that when you spoke or you just said Yah, which represented their abbreviation, you kicked the dust of your feet and you stepped aside because the place where you spoke that was holy ground. That's why they are before the wailing wall and they are in constant movement is because they are constantly invoking the name of Elohim Adonai. Amen. And so they are moving. They got to be moving. Praise God. Praise God. That's why before uh, the throne in the book of Revelation, that the angels are never still. Amen. I, I, Ezekiel described them running like torches of lightning round and round the throne. They are never still day or night. They are running and round and round because we are saying holy and they are saying, this is what they say, holy, holy, holy. Lord God, Amen. Yahweh Elohim, thank God. Holy, holy, holy. Yahweh Elohim, thank God. You are holy. Thank. And they don't quit saying it day or night. But uh, uh, that's the reason that the Jews move so much when they're praying at the Wailing Wall. Well, he asked me uh, how that did we see Jesus. And I said, I'll tell you, what is your abbreviation for the Tetragrammaton? He said, take two Yodhs, that first letter, and put a Shiva underneath each one of them. A Shiva is two dots, one over the other, and it is pronounced Yah. And when they pronounced the word, they would not say Yahweh. Uh, they would say simply, Yah. What is, what is his name in the Old Testament? Yatsid Kinu. The Lord is our righteousness. Thank God. Uh, we would say, uh, what, uh, Yah, Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Yah, 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 The Lord is our deliverer. And our banner, put Yah in front of it. I asked him, I said, what is salvation? How do you say salvation? He said, Shua. I said, we worship Yah, Shua, Joshua. Thank God, which is translated through the Greek into English as Jesus. His name is no mystery to us. We know what his name is. He is no longer Yah Sidkinu. He is not just now Yah Shalom, but Yah has become salvation. Thank God. Amen. And the angel said, you're going to name him Jesus because he is going to save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a lot of people named Jesus in the day and before the day of Jesus. If you read in the book of Hebrews, you'll read a strange thing. People uh, said we ought to just read the King James and nothing else. Well, when you read the King James, uh, in the seventh chapter, it says, if, if Jesus had given them rest, then they would not have waited or been promised another day of rest. We would not have looked for another. Actually, they meant to say, if Joshua had given them rest. But because the writer of the book of Hebrews 
could not read Hebrew. He read Greek and he translated from the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, 250 years before Christ. He did not translate from the Hebrew. He translated from the Greek. That is the reason that you have the word. If Jesus, instead, if Joshua had given them rest, talking about Israel in the old day, then we would not have expected another. But uh, for that reason, you have that difficulty in translation. You know where it, uh, it talks about, it says it makes his, he makes his ministers flames of fire and uh, winds, uh, his ministers as winds. He is translating from the Greek. The original Hebrew says, he makes flames of fire his servants. And he makes winds his ministers. Praise God. It means that God can take anything in the world and make an angel or a servant out of it and make it do His will. Amen. But uh, they said, just change that a little bit and it'll be all right. Because they knew what Pilate had written up there. Just take the first letter of each word and you've got the God of the Old Testament. And he said, I'm not going to change it. What I have written, I have written. Praise God. And I'm echoing that today. What I have written, I have written. Hallelujah. I believe He is the God of the Old Testament. Thank God. The Old Testament, He says, I am the Almighty. In Revelation, Jesus is called the Almighty. He is never called, you never read about the Son of God after the third chapter, you read about a Son of Man. But the Son of God after the church is gone, it's never called the Son of God anymore. After that, He is called Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first one and the last one. Thank God. He is called the Almighty. And there is in the word Ponter Quotor, there is an exclusiveness built into that word. That means it excludes everybody else. There is no other mighty. When he says, I am the almighty, it means there is no other mighty. One preacher says, the devil is almighty. He saw the consternation look upon people's face. And he said, but the Lord is mightier than he. It doesn't take a a, a real smart man to know that there's nobody mightier than the Almighty. Thank God. I believe that that God of the Old Testament took upon Himself the form of a man and walked among us. I believe what Pilate was seeing, he came back in after the third time and he said, Where are you from? Hmm... Something strange is going on here. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. He had to straighten it out. If it was of this world, my my attendance would have fought to prevent me from being taken by the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Where are you from? But I believe when he rode up there, Yeshua HaNetzeron and Ve Melechai Yehrum, that he was saying that he was Yahweh of the Old Testament. Hallelujah to God. I don't believe there are three persons in the Godhead or in God. There is no difference between a divine person and a God. You've got strange mathematics when you try to make one out of three. That's strange mathematics. Especially when you say they are divine persons. There was only one God. Thank God who took upon Himself. He was the Father in creation. He became the Son in redemption. And He is the Holy Ghost in emanation in the hearts of His elect. Oh, hallelujah to God. He said, when you see me, you see Him. 
That would be ludicrous language if any other man would say that. When you see me, you see him. But he who was entirely and totally God say, when you see me, you see him. He was not an ordinary being, but he was an extraordinary being. Glory to God. Before Abraham was, ego, I am. I, I am. It's the same words that Abraham heard, or Moses heard before the burning bush. Whom shall I say has sent me? Tell them in the Greek, it's ego, I am. I, I am. And Jesus used the same words over and over. I, I am. Oh, glory. Thank God. And he says that he was there before Abraham. He saw my day and was glad. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. They said, you're not yet 50 years old. That's a strange thing. They usually count it in decades. You're not yet 50 years old. Uh, A lot of folks think that would put him in the 40 age bracket. We think 33 and a half years. I won't argue the point. But they said, you're not 50 years old. How can you say that uh, Abraham saw your day and was glad? He said, I'll tell you, before Abraham was, ego I me. Thank God. That one that was in the burning bush was there. And I am that one that was in that burning bush. Oh, hallelujah to God. I am not ready to change what I have written. I have preached for years that Jesus is the Almighty God. Somebody says it's in semantics. You know, let's just join up with everybody else. It's all in semantics. It's just the way that you say it. Well, that's what they told Pilate. It's just in semantics. Just say, I am the king of the Jews, and we'll be happy. And he said, what I've written, I've written, and I'm not going to change on your behalf. I don't care whether you call it semantics or what you're going to call it. I'm still going to preach that there is no other God except the one that we worship today. Hallelujah to God. He is God over all. Blessed forever. Oh, hallelujah. The mystery of the godliness, they say, the mystery of the Trinity, uh, is it, it really is a mystery. The scripture doesn't say that the mystery is a Trinity. Paul said, without a controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Amen. Not the Trinity. That's not the mystery. The ministry is Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Believed on the Lord. Preached on the Gentiles. Thank God received up in the glory gave gift to men. That's the mystery. How that one God came down and became a man and walked among us. And John said we beheld his doxa. We beheld his brilliance. We beheld his shining as the only or the only kind of one. As the unique one, the monogenes. He is not the monogenao, the only begotten. He is the monogenes, which means he is the only kind of a son. There never was another one like him. Thank God. Not only begotten, but the only kind of a son. Thank God. What I have written, I have written, and I'm not going to change for anybody else. What about Pilate's code today? Are you willing to go along with that? Praise God. Did you know when they came to him to ask for permission concerning the burial, they said, would you give us a guard so that we can secure his grave? Because he has prophesied that if he is killed in three days... I'll raise it up again, or I will be raised again. He actually said, I will raise it up again. Therefore, give us a guard, lest the last deception, lest they steal away his body and claim that he's resurrected, and the last deception will be worse than the first. The Pilate said it the strangest way, if you can read it from the Greek. 
He said that you have your guard. I give it to you. You go make it as safe and secure as you know how. Amen. You go make it as secure as you know how to make it. He was saying in so many words, you can do all you need to do. But if he said that man said he was going to raise up, you got some problems on your hand. Glory, glory, glory. Amen. You can make it as safe as you want to. You can do whatever you want to. But there's not enough demons in hell. There's not enough power. There's not enough anything to keep him down. If he says, I'm going to rise, hallelujah, he's going to get up from there. The church is here celebrating today because we believe that they had a guard there and they made it as safe as they knew how to make it, but that wasn't good enough. He still got out of there. Oh, glory to God. He's alive today and He is here among us. We not only have Him in here, but we've got Him in here as well. Oh, glory. Somebody said you're not supposed to go by feeling. Paul said feel after him. We're not doing wrong for feeling after God. Feel after him. That perhaps you may find him. Oh glory to God. I believe in feeling after God. I believe you can feel him. He is still alive. He is still here today. Oh, glory to God. What I have written, I have written. You make it as safe as you know how to make it. But he's still there. You say it like you want to say it. But he is still God over all. Blessed forever. Can we praise him a little bit today? Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. We need to continue the conviction of Pilate's code. And that is what we have written, we've written. It's no time to change now. It's no time to wash out lines now. This is not the day and the hour to say, all right, it's just a little semantics, we'll join up with you. This is not the time to say, it doesn't make any difference, we'll baptize you. Either way, you want to be baptized. Amen. That's not the way we do it. There's a lot of people that's going to that today that used to be Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, one God, tongue-talking people. Amen. In order to fit the crowd, they're saying we'll baptize you either way. It's a matter of semantics. But I believe there is only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow things in heaven, all things on earth, all things that are under the earth, there is only one name. Hallelujah. What name is it that is efficacious in baptism? You may be seated. They, they knew the secret. He said, I'm not going to, what I've written, I've written. That's going to stay there. He is Yahweh. He is the God of the Old Testament. There's many ways to prove it. But they said, you are not a friend to Caesar if you don't allow him to be crucified. Pilate allowed him to be crucified, but he would not allow the change of the title. Because that was his own right and his personal belief that the code meant that he was the God of the Old Testament. But when they said, you are not a friend, that caused him to want to kind of shift and to allow him to be crucified. Somebody said, do you think Pilate will be saved? It's not for me to say. All I can tell you about what Jesus said is, your condemnation will be less than their condemnation, those that delivered you, me to you. 
I don't know how much is meant in that. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of condemnation on people who used to preach the gospel. And because it has been said, you're not going to be a friend to this one or that one or the other, they have changed their code. Amen? I don't believe in changing it for anything or anybody in the world. Praise God, praise God. Did you know there are people that are willing to dismiss entire, almost entire chapters of the Bible in order to gain friendship with the rest of the world? Amen. They'll change. They say, oh, oh, they'll go along and say, you're Pharisees. Some of those who used to be with us are now calling us a Pharisee. And they wouldn't know a Pharisee if he was to come up and hit them with his phylactery. They don't know what a Pharisee is. A Pharisee is not one who holds for the law and the letter of the law. Jesus said, you praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Do you know where he's quoting from? He's quoting from Isaiah. That scripture reads in the book of Isaiah, you take this book and you hand the first, the book first of all to an intelligent man, a scribe, one that can read all kinds of writings. He opens it up and he looks at it and he said, I can't understand it. It's too mysterious. They were Kabbalists. They believe in the mysticism. It's too, it's a sealed, they said it's a sealed book. So Isaiah said you take the book and you hand it over to a man who is illiterate. And he is legitimate. He said, I can't read it all. One man says, it's too mysterious. The other one said, I can't read it. So they closed the book and they said, let's just praise God anyhow. And they began to make their interpretation of the Torah called the Targum. Then they began to make their interpretation of the Targum and the Mishnah. And what they wound up by the time Jesus was there was an interpretation of an interpretation. They were not even quoting the book of God. A Pharisee is one who does not quote the book of God or the Torah. It is too holy. It is too mysterious. Or either they can't read it. They call it seal. They will read and comment upon the Talmud. They will comment upon the interpretation of the interpretation. Brother, we are not interpreting, interpreting, or interpreting an interpretation. We are reading from the book itself. Hallelujah. And when it says, it is a shame for a man to pray with long hair... We're not, we're not interpreting that some other way. We mean it exactly like it says. Tomorrow I probably be on holiness a good bit. But I want you to know that the scripture tells us that if a man prays and he's got long hair, he shames his head. And he just gets through telling you that his head is Christ. But a woman praying or prophesying let you know that a woman can prophesy. A woman praying or prophesying with her hair cut, come, with her hair cut, she shames her head, and that head is a, it shows the order of divine series. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. What that scripture does and what you're doing when you pray in the correct order and like you're supposed to, you're showing God you believe that He is the creator of all things. Don't call me a Pharisee because I opened that book and it tells me how I ought to be living. 
We've got Bible for everything we preach. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I get a little rougher? I am a little bit disgustipated with some of our preachers that will not try to get into the heavier teachings of Paul because they are saying within themselves it's too hard it's too difficult it's too mysterious we've got to quit playing around in the shallows I preach holiness in a lot of different places showing you how that the matter of hair is not a matter of being equal or better or one gooder than the other. It shows the order of creation. I've had preachers come up and said, I've preached holiness all of my life, but I never did know why it was. I say we need to quit splashing around in the shallows and get down in the book of God. Acts 2.38 is there, and I preach it, I hope, more than anybody else. But you've also got Corinthians, you've also got Ephesians, you've also got the other books that tell you how to live, how to walk, and how to worship, and how to dress. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you've got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all of this truth. Paul said this book is a book that is spiritually decided. Discern means it is spiritually decided. And our fleshly or carnal man cannot understand it. That's why you've got to have the Holy Ghost on the inside to see what you're reading right here. Thank God, but when you get that Holy Ghost, you start opening this book and everything start opening up together. Hallelujah. I'll tell you this much. I'll read it for the rest of my life and I'll never find out all about it that is there to find. Every time I read it, I find something new about Him because He is the eternal wonder. Hallelujah. And He is omniscient. And His Word is for everlasting. Oh, glory. He tells us how to not only how to dress. I can't wait. I'll get on it tomorrow. He said women with it in the King James shame face. The word is idols. It's the only time the word is used in the New Testament. It's a highfalutin word. You had to have a big vocabulary if you use the word idos. Paul used it. But it comes from the Hebrew word hacherpanim. And that's why the King James translators had it right. It is shocked face or blanched face, not a decorated face. Amen. I believe he's saying you got to be a pale face. Thank God or whatever color your face is, it's got to stay that way. The Bible say, or they ask us, they've asked me this before, have you got any scripture again where it says not to uh, paint your face? I said, don't you wish I didn't have? But what I've written, I've written. And I'm not going to go back on it. Enoch was quoted by both Jude and Peter. And Jude tells that the fallen angels called Nephilim come from the Hebrew word Nephal, which means to fall. In Sumerian language, it calls them the Anunnaki, those from heaven to earth who fell. The book of Enoch says it was the fallen angels that taught men how to make weapons of war and taught the women how to paint their face. Painting the face goes all the way back to the earliest civilization. Some preacher called me not long ago and said, Are you pushing for the acceptance of the book of Enoch into the canon? I said, I don't have to. 
Peter and Jude both quote it. Amen. Did you know Jude said about that particular scripture of the fallen angels where it says these defile the flesh? The word is maino. These paint the flesh. We got scripture for it. Hallelujah to God. And I'm not reading from an interpretation of an interpretation. I'm not a Pharisee. I'm a Holy Ghost, Jesus name fell, apostolic, that believed every word in this book is true. I believe we're going to be judged by this book. I believe we need to know every bit of it, every page of it, every letter of it. We've got to try to qualify on every bit of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh yeah, it's there. It's there. Where it says, don't defile these, defile the flesh. It means these paint the flesh. Just as clear. The only time the word is used, but that's exactly what it means. What I have written, I have written. But you are not a friend to somebody else if you don't go along with this. That's just as sad as it can be. If I am the only man left, I'm like Elder Gidros, and I find one more man that believes this is exactly like I do, I'm going to put my arm around him and say, here's the New Testament church. Hallelujah to God. I'm saying if we got the word. Hallelujah to God. Oh no, a Pharisee is one not didn't love the word. Ah. Uh, they they did a lot of strange things. How much time have I got here? Here's the kind of thing they do. You had an offering, here is the Talmud. The Talmud is a commentary that will reach from here to over yonder. All the little tiny minute things that you had to do. You had an offering, you brought it to the temple, and you just threw it at the offering pan. I've seen folks do that. <laughs> Amen. They took up an offering in the dark last night. I don't know whether I gave a hundred or a one. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the Talmud says, wherever that money lands, you got to get your measuring stick. And you got to measure from that money to whichever pot it's closest to. It's far, if it's for the tabernacle or the temple, if it's near there, it goes in that pot. But if it goes to that offering for the poor, you put it in that one. That's the Talmud. That's commenting upon it. I, I trust that it would be alright for me to mention this here today. There has been a, a lawsuit against the university at Brown University. A professor teaching the Talmud. And he was sued for sexual harassment. Simply by quoting it. And I'll not be specific, I'll not be very plain, I'll just tell you uh, how he says it, and how the Talmud says it. A man falls off the top of a building, lands on a woman, etc., 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 to decide what kind of a situation you've got there. Suing him for sexual harassment. That's how close the Talmud comes. That's not in the book. It's because they said we can't understand it. And because we can't understand it, we're going to just praise God anyhow. Have you heard those words? Let's just praise God anyhow. It don't make any difference what you look like. It don't make any difference what you say. Let's just praise God anyhow. But what I have written, I have written. You can take him and you can make it as sure as you can make it that he won't get out of that ground. But you're not going to change what I put up there at the head of that cross. That this is the God of the Old Testament. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What I have written, I think we ought to say it together. What I have written, I have written. Praise God. There is no way that we can dismiss entire Scripture. We were talking to someone about gray areas 
where the Bible doesn't say. Paul says, To the married, I have not a commandment by speak my judgment, I ask by permission. He said it himself. But to the virgins, I have a commandment. Amen. To one, I have, I have word from God. On the other one, I don't. But it is that you be faithful. I believe we ought to qualify what I'm saying or what the book is saying. But I'm going to ask you one question that Paul asked of the church. What fellowship does light have with darkness? The word in Greek is actually, what is the common denominator between light and darkness? What is the equation to where light ceases to be light and starts being darkness? Hmm. What fellowship has Christ with Belial, which is the Lord of Flies? It's the lowest God on the totem pole. The Lord of flies. What fellowship has Christ with Belial? Paul says, I'm writing you not that you don't have just complete company with the world, because otherwise you'd have to get out of the world. But he said, I'm writing about fellowship. Praise God. You know what fellowship is? That's when a bunch of people can get together and they can all enjoy the same thing. They believe the same thing. They're saying the same thing. What fellowship is there between light and darkness? First of all, he says you decide things this way. If a man invites you to go to dinner to eat, you sit down and begin eating and don't ask any questions. What changes the situation? The situation changes when he gives you a little bit of information and he says, did you know that the meat that you're eating was sacrificed unto idols? Paul says, stop eating. Amen. All that makes the difference is a little bit of knowledge. I can't have that man thinking that I believe in eating meat that's sacrificed to idols. Paul said because the next thing he does, he sees you sitting in an idol's temple. One thing leads to another. The world and the devil can't just see you going a little way. They got to take you all the way. I've heard that there are preachers who have apologized uh, to the women that they ever preached holiness. Why should I believe Him now if I couldn't believe Him then? Praise God. Amen. If a man says I was wrong then, but I'm right now, how do I know that? The only way I know is to pick up that book and say, what I have written, I have written. I haven't changed my gospel. I haven't changed my gospel since I was a 12-year-old kid and I received it at a Holy Ghost altar. Hallelujah to God, I haven't changed it. I believe you still got to walk right, talk right, live right, and spit white. Hallelujah! Don't you know, Paul says, that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? That changes a whole lot of things. All you got to know is how careful you treat the temple. You do certain things before you enter in. I am careful what goes into this temple. I am careful little eyes what you see. I am careful little ears what you hear. I am careful little heart what you believe. Because this doesn't belong to me. This belongs unto God. And I have given it to Him a long time ago. What I have written, I have written. I don't care if you change it a little bit. And it is in the book of God. You still are as wrong as you can be. Say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. It is a sealed book. 
but the Bible says with the Holy Ghost we are able to understand it. I believe Pilate was deeply moved when he saw Jesus on the cross. As I told you, his face was disfigured more than any man's. And that scars on his face was enough to cause embarrassment among the disciples. Up by the lake of Galilee that night, he came and appeared to them. And they came from fishing, and he already had uh, fish uh, on the fire. It said, they, no man durst ask him anything. There was kind of a, kind of a, a, a subdued silence that was all around. I personally think that it's cause that they could hardly look at his face. It was so beat up. And it was so changed. But I'm going to tell you this. I love him enough that I believe Calvary was not an aggregate sacrifice. The Bible did say he died once and for all. But I believe that he died for one individual as well. If I had been the only one, I still believe he would have died for me. How many got that faith down within your heart today? Oh, glory, glory. I know there is a church. Oh, and it is an uncountable number. We're going to see in heaven. But I think he died for me just by myself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to deny him. Glory to God. What I have written... I have written, and I'm not going to change it for anybody. I believe in one God, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-powered, holy living. Glory, glory, glory. I believe your fellowship ought to be with the church of the living God. I have nothing in common with people who preach other things. Say they're nearly right. You can be almost plumb, but not quite hardly. But that doesn't make me any difference. I've already preached it too many times to back up now. I'm like Paul. Why are you breaking my heart? Don't go up and he said, I am not only ready to be bound in Jerusalem, but I am ready to die in Jerusalem. How many here today are ready to die for the gospel that you've got down on the inside? I've always said I didn't believe the church is going through tribulation, which is really not the proper word. Uh, it is actually through the wrath of God. I've always said that we were not going through that. But I don't know how much we may go through with. I don't know how much before the end is here we may go through with. But I'm going to tell you right now what I've written. I've written. And it's going to stay up there. Hallelujah, just like it is. Until Jesus comes. Glory to God. They took Michael Savitas. Uh, they were going to burn at least one Christian. And they asked him to recant his baptism and his belief that Jesus was God. And he said, I cannot deny that Jesus is God any more than I can deny that the ray of the sun is the sun itself. Or that the voice is different than the man who spoke the words. And they had him killed. I'm not going to back up on it at all. Hallelujah to God. I can't see any difference in the sun and the rays that the sun put out. I can't see any difference in the God that made the world and the God that is ruling and reigning and is in emanation in my heart today. I believe if the God that created me, if it's the same God, the same Holy Ghost can change me into His image and to His likeness. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God. God bless you. I don't know whether I'm over time or not, but I just, I wanted you today to know that the Word of God says it plain enough. You don't have to run anywhere for help. 
Just read it and ask the Holy Ghost. Thank God. And the scripture, the Bible says the uh, scripture is of no private interpretation. What does it mean by that? It means that the scripture was not given privately by our, and neither is it to be interpreted that way. But the Holy Ghost moved upon men. Thank God. And they wrote as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. Neither do we interpret the Word of God privately. But as we read the Word of God, they wrote, that same Spirit comes upon our heart. And when we read that He is the first and the last, thank God, uh, the living, the Almighty, we say, thank God, I understand what it means right now. How many believe you understand who He is and what He is today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.